So welcome everyone after the small break. Uh, I, I, I think I'm audible to the last row, right? Like, am I audible? Clear? Great. So I'm Arvind, and uh, I work at a company called Elastic, uh, which is the creator of Elasticsearch, Logstash, Kibana, and all of these open source projects. And uh, today, we, today we are going to talk about uh, the story of how we have developed an uh, uh, operator on Go uh, to be like to run Elasticsearch on Kubernetes. So before I get started, uh, this is a usual practice that I do at a lot of conferences wherein like a lot many people, uh, a lot many times, like people take photos of the speaker, but they don't take photos of the attendees. So this is like a trend that I do. And before we get started, if you call, can stand up. I'll take a photo selfie with you, and then like I'll post on Twitter, like and we all can like you can you all can be part of the session as well. So if you can stand up and stretch for a while and say what what up or or whatever, yeah. Say cheese. Thank you, thank you. That's cool. So yeah, how many of you know Elasticsearch? or heard Elasticsearch? How many of you use in production? Cool. So uh, for the people who didn't raise hands, or probably like, oh, I have heard about it, but I really don't know what it is. So I, I'd give you a brief, very brief intro. And then we'll, we'll talk about more, more interesting stuff. So if you have used Uber, or if you have given a point A and point B in any of these ride-sharing apps, and you try to do the the try to map the do the rider get a cab actually or the rider driver pairing happens on uh, Elasticsearch. So basically, like uh, uh, or trying to search for rides, you're literally doing search for rides. Or even when you are trying to order your favorite food, uh, like you are searching on Elasticsearch and in a lot of these places. Similarly, seamless experience. A lot of these digital experiences that are powered today are 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 powered by a distributed system called Elasticsearch. But today we are not really like talking more about that. We are talking about something different. Like uh, you know, there are there are multiple ways that you could run Elasticsearch. Um, I mean, or the, the entire stack. Uh, we're going to talk about how do you run this. What are the various ways, uh, or or how we have developed a specific way to run on to run it on Kubernetes. So uh, a lot many uh, Kubernetes is like the the big container orchestration platform. And a lot many organizations have Kubernetes first strategy, like develop, deploy, run, do anything and everything but on Kubernetes, right? So we even have a Kubernetes operator. Uh, and then like it's called Elastic Cloud on Kubernetes. You could deploy, run, or like uh, develop, or like even do a lot of these things on, on, on the run on the entire stack on the Kubernetes platform. So all, all sorts of versions, vanilla, OpenShift, uh, like even uh, GKE, AKS, EKS, any 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 platform of type of Kubernetes, you could use that. Similarly, like uh, integrated, and also like you have different sort of architectural templates. But all of these are powered by a common core framework or the API structure that uh, Rims or even uh, or even like the other other speakers have spoken about. It's called custom resource definitions, or or otherwise these are called as operators. How many of you use operators in Kubernetes today? Operator, heard about operator? No? Okay, cool. Like. I'll talk more about operators, uh, but yeah, like we'll 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 talk more in detail about the problems as well. So operators are the clients of this API. Like they act as controllers. Uh, they have a custom resource definition uh, through which you can deploy any general purpose software. So there are multiple, uh, you know, ways of like uh, multiple general purpose software like Redis, Kafka, MySQL, and uh, all of these are databases, uh, distributed systems, stateful systems. More importantly, they share data between them between in, inside the same system. So all of this is really complicated in a way to run in regular infrastructure. How do you run in a scalable, much scalable or much optimized uh, platform? like Kubernetes. So that's what uh, operators help you solve. That's how you can run all of these complex systems much easier by automating the regular processes. So like, no, I, I didn't really get it. If you feel in that manner, I have, I have a UI. So I could explain it much better. So Kubernetes has API server. Everyone with me, right? API server. And then uh, the API server will be the one, like a state machine, wherein you 
ask, talk to it to get more details. You do kubectl get parts, it literally hits the API server or, or in between uh, cache and like try to get the parts, try to get the resources that are deployed in Kubernetes. So here, custom resource definition is something like a template that is there on, uh, that is given to the API server which enforces a specific sort of state uh, with the application that is running on top of it. So Elasticsearch, even though it's a system, it is just an application in the Kubernetes place and then you, we are running uh, as just like an application. So but what does it, what more it does? Not just doing this. Suppose uh, it spins off, it watches a resource, spins off a part, uh, especially in a distributed system like uh, Elasticsearch, you have multiple nodes. So nodes are probably like you could think of like parts or containers which runs this software and coordinates with everything. So you see and watch all the parts. It does create, update, and delete, uh, get the resource spec, also like uh, creates the expected resources. You know that the way why it expected is highlighted? We'll, we'll, I'll explain more in the, in the deep, deeper terms, like why and what are the various problems that, that are there. So there are, there are multiple things when we say expected uh, in a specifically state-based uh, machine, like you have, uh, you have a specific sort of spec that you want to deploy. For example, say that you have, I want to deploy a three master node and two data node uh, based Elasticsearch cluster, right? So then you are having a five node cluster, right? Uh, then you might also want to do all the wiring between them, all the APIs that are exposed, and a lot of these details. So this basic template through which uh, the operator, when you ask the API server, it will get deployed. But there are many things more than that. Not just deploying these things, but there are many things like how does Elasticsearch works, uh, where are the backups stored, or probably what are the naming conventions, uh, whether the nodes are TLS, uh, b are, are having a TLS encryption in between them, or uh, are they like, where are the secrets stored, then um, many, many things, like uh, many, many things that are happens in a distributed system. This is not per se with Elasticsearch, it can also happen with like, uh, other systems which need, which are stateful in nature. That's where like the stateful sets even come into play. So like much more, more and more details, not just that. You also have a HTTP service through which like connects all of them, like exposes the API. So majority of the stuff. Uh, so everything gets reconciled, like every time when you ask for something to be done, there are all of these operations that needs to happen. Suppose you add one more node, then it needs to join the cluster, get into all of this, share all the data, share all the TLS and everything, certificates, everything, and be part of the cluster, start working for the problem that you want to solve. So these are many, many things, like uh, stateful sets enable us or any stateful system to get all of this pretty easily. Now, that is how you end up interacting with the software like Elasticsearch. Like, this is the end goal, wherein you, you deploy, run, and like you finally uh, start looking at something like Elasticsearch. But again, more than that, not just deploying this configuration for one time, you also might want to uh, upgrade the cluster over a period of time, like because there are newer versions, newer features, and a lot of these things. You might also look for migrating the data in some cases where you have better hardware into your Kubernetes platform, and uh, you might want to like just roll off and like put, up, put in something, right? You could also do node, drain the node and like replace the part. So how do you do all of these, uh, all of these updates? So operators are the custom resource definitions are controllers which helps you to do all of this. You automate this logic into a place and makes Elasticsearch like a resource uh, to be managed on the Kubernetes. So you could literally do it for your application as well if it is, if it requires. But this is the story that I'm trying to tell you, like how do you do it for even your application? So there are specific tools and libs that we followed uh, under the Kubernetes special interest group, six. Uh, there's something called Kube Builder, which is really uh, popular in building this, uh, you know, the custom resource definitions, uh, which in turn uses like the controller tools and controller runtime. Uh, you could also go and like look at these and like try to develop this stuff. Uh, but these are some, some related details. Now, all this is like kind of uh, over, over the web if I tell you like maybe you might not believe that whether this is possible, how do I get and do it. So there are two ways to do uh, Kubernetes operators. One way is to like use uh, the Go, Golang, and uh, deploy or create and write controller and put it into your, uh, like put it into your Kubernetes uh, using, uh, using, still using an AML file. Uh, but 
if you want to see the code and how this reconciliation, how this entire process of logic works, uh, this is how it is. Like uh, there is there is a specific method or function called reconcile, wherein um, each and everything, like services, certificates, uh, nodes, or how the client and other secrets are configured. Let us take a look at one specific service, uh, which helps you to like get a deeper understanding of what happens. Now, at the same point of time, I'm trying to tell a story here, not just like what we have done. Uh, the problems that we also face uh, when we are run, trying to run a massive system like uh, Elasticsearch in a Kubernetes, another massive system like uh, Kubernetes, which is also having a lot of moving modules. So if you see here, uh, we, we follow a specific naming structure around pods. We also like uh, do specific uh, uh, like particular ports that we enable, uh, do a lot of checks whether this is already created or not. Uh, most importantly, sometimes when you kind of like commit or give an issue like, I want, to, I want to delete this pod, and the pod still exists by the time you try to create another pod, the other pod still get is existing. So there are many multiple uh, conflict and uh, other areas that that does again and again. So so all of these like there are multiple methods or multiple functions which are sequential in nature and also like uh, returns early when there is an issue. So you keep doing it until you get into a desired state actually so until you get to the state that you want to do like you have set a state in your aml file it keeps happening the controller ensures that this ent entire thing but this is a logic that is written by us so if you are writing your application it is pretty abstract in nature you probably might want to manage this through your kube admin i mean the the administrator of kubernetes cluster so the two basic or primary themes that I want to uh, like like explore here is like the operator lives in the past, wherein um, whenever we try to create a specific pod and uh, see if there are okay this pod isn't exist and I just want to like create another pod, like uh, you might end up creating more or you might not get the pod that you want you have already created. So this is because uh, sometimes that uh, the the client uses a cached reader, wherein the cache is stored and like. Uh, it, you would not be able to like get the latest resources or the latest updates, but uh, it's also very tentative because in some cases you can't go and call API server all the times because there's a performance limitations. So that is one another one problem that we faced when we are trying to build this thing. Uh, but this creates multiple downward spirals and like a lot of other problems that we face in a regular distributed system. So for example, we could continue keep creating the pods forever, pod missing create one so we because it's a logic that we write and uh, that could happen as well or we could also come into a situation like if there is a split brain which is very specific to elastic search a problem it could also the, it and uh, it, it doesn't reach the quorum uh, because elastic search is a distributed system and you have consensus or uh, several things that helps you to maintain high availability if we don't reach that quorum you kind of end up having this problem as well. Then double rolling upgrade, suppose you, you kind of like want to upgrade and you try deleted a pod, recreated it, and uh, you get it, it doesn't work, so again you try to recreate it. So these are some of the problems that we, we understood. And like you keep doing this reconciliation forever, sometimes when you are creating this op operator. So what we can do is something that we already uh, like we thought of. For example, uh, there is no way that we can't uh, live without running uh, operator or, or running on Kubernetes. So we, there are two major themes like optimistic concurrency that that could uh, specifically help. Optimistic concurrency is a strategy that is used in transaction or a relational databases structure, wherein like uh, it's it's a model of con concurrency, it's a way wherein like you you kind of read the data, but you before you commit your changes, you check whether the data that is read by you is not changed. So by somebody else. So this is uh, this should happen mostly in less data retention or less data contention places. Um, so what we have done is like uh, we we kind of like na name name the particular parts with a specific name that we know. So so that like it's always suffixed or prefixed with a specific name. Uh, there is also something called resource version which you could take help of. Similarly, you also have. Uh, similar sort of things when you want to try to delete these pods. Like we also get something like UID, the pod UID that we have seen. And you need to keep track of it to ensure that you are not deleting it uh, if the UID is not there. So these are some, some processes that we, we found. Uh, so 
the quick takeaways here is like uh, use deterministic naming that you can track and also like always assume a stale cache like because the client uses a cache reader then you could also look at like the cons reconciliation entirely should be item important like the state should reach uh, in a certain manner so this is the learning when we are trying to do a uh, uh, operator these are some best practices there might be more as well as we as we develop more and more into different platforms or like try to use it for large scale it it might also be like imperative and like more and more and more things might come so but also like we feel that uh, it's important that you empower users and let people decide what they want to do with uh, with the Kubernetes. So a lot many people might have a specific sort of pod template or uh, guaranteed or run by their security teams, etc. So we offer them a specific, uh, not just defaults. We offer them a structure to, so that like they could go and deploy in a, in, or, I say in a specific policy, like no definity rules or. I mean, maybe like even their desired RAM consumption rate, all of this. So, so that is one another thing that you could also do like. like. So, when we talk about stale, I mean, stateful set, and uh, when we talk about distributed systems, one thing that like one thing that comes out open is like the data. So, how do you ensure that uh, the data the data is always there when you kill a node? How do you ensure that the same data comes up or or the data rebalancing doesn't happen? And uh, that is what stateful sets meant to do, right? It binds you with uh, the pod, and the persistent volumes get binded uh, to a specific. Uh, to, it gets binded again and again, so that like you don't need to create this entire volume again. So, yeah. So, so we have a specific structure, or we have implemented that. We also have small some problems around that as well, through which like. We, we we have implemented so for example if you have two stateful sets one is like a master nodes and like you also have like data nodes then uh, imagine that uh, you have binded them with uh, volume claim templates be it like say uh, you have uh, if you are in a different cloud provider it might be different sort of storage class but if you are using your own file system it might be again different but if there are that sort of like storage classes and you bind it with the thing so whenever you you see a specific node or a pod goes off your data still be the same and uh, it will try to like reconnect to the same volume that you have attached to that pod so this is one one such thing that that helps uh, like really large scale at large scale uh, but again all of this will come with ifs and buts so uh, so th that way, like uh, you can take control of what sort of state that you want to maintain, and all of this logic resides in the operator that you don't need to manage. So this is what is managed by us uh, and helps you to develop, uh, solve your own business problems, not working only on Elasticsearch, running Elasticsearch, uh, because not you might not want to become an Elasticsearch expert. You might want to solve your own business problem. So yeah, at the same time, um, you, there are other things like uh, we we make sure that the the until the cluster is green, uh, the, the 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 reconciliation or everything should be stable and should be present. Uh, but otherwise, like you will risk losing the data. Uh, uh, so this also puts you in a pressure like wherein if you are if you are having less resources, probably there might be a chance of latency. But uh, we will also disable the shards uh, like the 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 shards or data rebalancing it between so all of this is automatically happening but uh, it is helpful uh, if you also know what uh, like what what sort of things that are achieved using this yeah so end of the day like when you delete a pod it automatically gets recreated it gets attached to the thing so should i build an operator should i should i be using an operator so that is a question that everyone has when you are running applications on Kubernetes. So I just want to like give a, some huge final summary, wherein um, if you have complex business logic and you have uh, systems which interact with data are stateful systems, like say trade systems, business related trade systems, and you want to preserve data or in-memory stuff, then uh, probably like you might want to take a look at operators. Uh, we really tried. We have automated a lot of stuff. But that is one another thing. Uh, but also, like, uh, if there is complex business logic itself, like we're in, in dealing, in computing stuff, um, in ensuring that uh, things are stable, which are internal to your application, then also you probably might want to look at and abstractify that logic so that if whoever is deploying and scaling, like your support uh, people, they would definitely uh, enjoy doing running your application at scale when there is a demand. So also, like, you could 
think of using something like Helm Charts. We also have a Helm Charts, but uh, if not, you are a regular app wherein you want a CI/CD functionality and like you want to do a continuous deployment. You could create a Helm Chart and like do versioning and start deploying version-based uh, applications. That still works out to be well. But this is much on a layer above the Helm Chart and like helps you to do more, more stuff. So. More or less, like when we also test, there are multiple things that we do. Uh, testing the operator is also not so simple. Uh, like you see here, it, it, is, it is also like really, really complex. And you need to take a call in like whether I want to do it or whether, whether, whether I, I don't want to like do it and like go and go into something like Helm. So if you, if you are like interested, like please take this away and like I would like to hear the feedback about the project and uh, learn more and also like you might stand a chance to win Google Home. So, so yeah, uh, that's it from my side, and uh, thanks for coming. <laughs>